ChatteractCoach.com podcast series, episode number 78, with Dr. Inder Paul Singh, Yag Laser for Floaters, One Hand of Attractomy, and MIGS. Welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast, and today I have a very special guest, a dear friend, Paul Singh. You may know him as Mr. Glaucoma. He's everywhere. <laughs> Runs the yes. eye centers of Racine and Kenosha there in Wisconsin. You know oh, it. You know Although he's a Chicago boy at heart. No, no, I'm a Wisconsin boy, man. I was born and bred. I was born and bred in Wisconsin, man. I got the cheese head, the beer and cheese in Packer Baines, man. They they put it in you when you're born here, man. You have to have that no matter where you go. It's it's so when I was a kid, truly true story, man. When I was a kid, my parents they grew up in, they grew up in India. They came from India back in the '60s, and when I went to college, my parents actually like they made me. Uh, they gave me a box and said, "We when you when they leave." We leave. Make sure you open this box and remember your roots. So they dropped me off in college. Okay. They leave. You and went in, to wash you in St. Louis. I wash you in St. Louis, man. And when I went to school in St. Louis, they dropped me off. I, they left. I'm like, oh, that box. I opened the box. I swear to God, man, it had made me a customized cheese head <laughs> that fit over my turban. So I'd always remember my roots. It wasn't a Bible. It wasn't a good. It wasn't like a good car like that. No, no, man. Cheese head. So, so I'm a Packer cheese head by heart and heart, man. Through and through, bro. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, you did med school in Chicago, Chicago med, and then you did residency in Cook County. So you yep. had a good number of years in Chicago. That's a good I eight love, years. I still love Chicago, man. I grew up in the I grew up in the 80s and 90s when we had like the Bulls, man. We had the Jordan era. It was it was pretty sweet. But when it came to football, man, I couldn't be a Bears fan. I love. I mean, I, I love the rivalry, but I'm a Packer fan. <laughs> it's it's one, can't help it. Like, isn't that the only NFL team where you can actually buy shares in it? On the yeah, I'm, I'm an owner. My son's an owner, dude. <laughs> but one one millionth of an owner, man. But it's sweet. <laughs> so I got my little stock card and everything. That's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Now, you you're, tell me about your path in ophthalmology. I can't help but notice the pic of your pops behind yeah, you. Yeah, dude. You're, you know your me. Father was a, I, he was a mentor to me 20 uh, years ago. He was just a real sweet guy. He just said, you know, is there anything I can do to help you? And Oh. oh, dude. I'm um, so thank you for bringing him up, man. I and if ever in, in any event, if I can go to, if I can bring up my dad, I try to because truly I owe so much to him. If it wasn't for my dad, I wouldn't be anywhere to the close to the man I am today. Not just from an ophthalmology perspective, but from a man as a person, as a human being, as a provider, as a professional, of course, as a surgeon. But um, so my dad was an ophthalmologist. He grew up in the India, came here, went to school, Wash U, did his, did his training here, and he came to Wisconsin. And by, by the way, when he left residency there's only two places that will allow him to practice back in the 60s a very different time and back in the 60s it was either wisconsin or florida and i keep wanting i kept asking my dad why did you go to wisconsin not florida what's wrong with you dad and he was like but son there's more sadars more sikhs in chicago which is closer to wisconsin so he could be closer to some and they had more indian churches are called gurdwaras which is uh kind of our, our sikhs in our religion our kind of sunday worship area so there's more of those closer to wisconsin so he, he went to wisconsin and grew up started his own practice and what he taught me was so many cool things so he was the first to do many things we talk about first to do this first to do that but back then the lens and plan that what we think is we take for granted the iol was still something that people were doing back in the 60s and 70s. So in 77, right. 70, 74, actually, say 74, he was the first person in Wisconsin to put an IOL in, in the state of Wisconsin. He got his license revoked, dude, because yeah. a lot of the local ophthalmologists were like, uh-uh, you're blasphemous. You're a foreigner doing this crazy stuff. Sorry. So he had to get the implant society to come in and defend him and prevent oh. present so that we could get his license reinstated. And now look what we're talking about, right? IOL is all, all over the place. And so it was that amongst many other kind of firsts and things that he had to fight for on so many levels. He had to fight to prove that his beer and his turban were sanitary enough to see patients. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't get covered under, under insurance. I mean, there's so many, so many stories that I get. And again, this is not like a negative thing, but it taught me, hey, look, if you believe in something, you got to do it. You got to stick to it. And yes, there are going to be naysayers out there, but you, you can't give up. And that mindset of like not giving up and doing the right thing and being prepared and always be prepared. If you're gonna do something that's nice. out of the ordinary, you can't just half-ass do it. You gotta do it. And so that mentality was something that he passed on to me. I'm not nearly as, I think, as strong as he was, but I, I think some of that passed on, hopefully, <laughs> at least. But that was so much of, and then how to start a practice, um, you know, how to just, take care of patients and be that that's your focus and and, and no matter what anyone's the rest of the world says you got to focus on what is best for my patient and all take care of itself that mindset was something that he just uh i think i still remember him today today it's it's um it's something i really appreciate from him 
Yeah, a lot of people, but a lot of young ophthalmologists who are under, let's say, under age 50 or even under age 40 may not know that decades ago, people called IOLs ticking time bombs in the eye. Oh, yeah. And then and a lot of academic people at the universities and the ivory towers would say, it's malpractice to even put any IOL on the eye. You leave them A-faking, give them A-fake specs. That was, that was it, right? I mean, that was crazy. And, you know, it's even yeah. funnier is I... I remember even FACO, man. Like when my dad was learning FACO in the 80s, et cetera, like everybody else, right? The whole Cavitron, everything else. So uh, my dad would come home, no joke, man. We would have like Indian samosa, and we'd have like you know chutney, and we'd have like dal roti. And my mom, my dad would put like a Betamax of a, a new FACO video. So I remember growing up in our kitchen table, watching like a, a cool FACO video while we're eating our Indian, you know, meals or our, our pot pot roast, you know, whatever it was. And and it was just so much fun because my dad was always, one thing I, I remember is he was always so happy and excited to keep learning. And that, that quest to not stop learning, you can never be complacent. And I, I still quote him all the time when I, when I do a lot of presentations because that mindset of like not being complacent was something that my dad taught me just by listening to him and watching him constantly evolve and never be stagnant. I, I was like, oh my God, I love this. <laughs> it was so much fun to just watch him. Well, you've taken that to the next level too, then your dad will be incredibly proud because you've done a ton of firsts in the glaucoma world. I mean, I tell people your glaucoma is one of your, your middle names here. You, this is what you do. <laughs> It's fun, man. No, it's fun. We're actually, it's funny to talk about glaucoma because when I came out of fellowship, man, glaucoma was like the way spe oh, you don't want to be a glaucoma specialist. Why would you ever want to do that? I'm like, oh my God, what do you just, you know, cut people's eyes open? No one ever gets better. You, 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 finished, <laughs> you finished your fellowship in glaucoma at Duke in like, I think, 04, right? 04, yeah, man. Good memory. Yeah, 04. Well, at, yeah, the, so. at the time, yeah, at the time, glaucoma was not cool. There not it was just all. like, you get all the end stage eyes after they've had three traps and they have no conj left. And then there was no MIGs. And that was it. It was like trap soups, trap soups, and then I wrote, okay, here's another funny story. So I come out of fellowship, and I gave my first like real talk at ASCRS Glaucoma Day, or it was one of these conferences, right? And I remember there was like before me was a cold cataract session and panelists. It was like a packed room, mm -hmm. and then like I woke up and they're like, and now Dr. Singh is going to be talking about how much mitomycin to use in a crab. And like everybody left the room. It was like <laughs> it was like break time. <laughs> so yeah, so it was those those were the days where like you know you walk into a room and like you're glaucoma. And they're like I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? You couldn't get into ocular plastics, you know? And and now it's kind of fun because we are doing, there's so much more we can do. And this whole idea of like maintaining high quality of life and still controlling the coma now with all the devices and technologies we have, it, it is exciting. It is a lot of opportunities now that we have to take care of patients earlier and do a better job than we ever have, I think. But it's been no, fun. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. It's, and there's so many new things in glaucoma that keep it kind of interesting. It, it's 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 on it's, con, it's constant it's like it's what i felt when my dad was learning how to do like rk and lasik and prk and all it just kept evolving every few years just trying to learn something new it's the same mindset okay now what can we do better how can we make a stent better how can we maybe do something different than a stent and this it's kind of fun because that whole innovative mindset that we saw in cornea and refractive and even retina you've seen now in the glaucoma space over the last decade just right. start to evolve and and it's it's a it's a cycle right the more we can do for our patients the more we can early intervene the more industry comes in the more providers start to get excited about it the more people start experimenting on things and next thing you know it's like oh wow okay now we have a potential and then it opens up a door we didn't realize and then it just kind of evolves from there so yeah i mean from the migs world from the stents to the canal dilating procedures the cutting procedures the new lasers now the in office lasers there's just such an abundance of technology and we're only getting started there's a lot of cool technology even now on the horizon i think we're going to see in the next five years that kind of really change paradigms uh, as well so it's exciting to be involved with that as well and more exciting to see earlier younger surgeons now picking it up and seeing the benefits that we took so long to figure out <laughs> like you know it took us right. decades to prove to ourselves and prove to our colleagues that hey you know what this stuff does make a difference do it earlier maintain high quality like get them off the drops all the stuff we preach now it took us 10 years to actually prove and convince people but now you have these young kids going yeah it makes sense and they're doing it and they're like wow this is great and so now they're liking to, to take take care of glaucoma and if you have more younger people even non-glaucoma specialists taking care of glaucoma early on you don't get as many of those advanced post 10 trap tube and no conj left like you said you know because I, I don't like, like those either <laughs> not at all now you also mentioned that there's some new technologies like lasers so arguably glaucoma is now one of the first subspecies to incorporate robotics because what some of these new lasers you basically line the patient up and just push the button and they'll go and then let, let the robot take over 
Dude, already, already. There's a, there's a, there's a. It's called direct SLT, DSLT. That's already been out in Europe now and should be coming to the U.S. It just got approved here not too long ago, and it's a basically a SLT laser okay. that allows you to directly place those laser spots externally. So there's no more gonioscopy, no more gel in the eye, and basically the laser itself, the, the machine, will auto recognize the limbus for you. And basically, you press a button, you can do it even remotely, and it'll actually go within a few seconds and create that SLT. There's another company that does excisional wow. gordiotomy. Um, I'm not sure I can name names in this, in this program, but there's another a company that also now does excisional gordiotomy. You can say whatever you want in this program. Okay, yeah. So basically, uh, so that, that DSLT, Alcon bought that laser from a company called Belkin. And now VLAs has a, has a technology that they're trying to get approved, which is basically doing in-office excisional femtosecond laser gordiotomy. So you lie a patient down, basically you put up a put up put a dock like a femto laser like a femto cataract almost and you can see the angle beautifully and you say you play say i want to go here here and here and it can make these 500 by 300 200 excisional gordiotomies perfectly placed wherever you want to place them and you just walk out of there walk in walk out like a lunchtime laser and so now we're saying we're, we're starting to do these kind of lasers and now there's going to be other future laters. There's a company called um, Ace Vision Group that does presbyopia correction, which is laser scleral microporation for presbyopia. Ooh, but one of the oh, benefits... I'm, I'm presbyopic talking about this. Eh, you know about that, man. So I, I don't actually know much too. about it. So, so, so what we're learning now with presbyopia, so getting out of my glaucoma hat for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we're learning about presbyopia is, of course, the crystal lens changes and then the surrey body, right? But what's happening, there are actually ligaments and, and zonules that actually attach from the surrey body to the Brooks membrane, to the okay. retina, basically. And what we do see with models now is that there's actually a, move, a movement, not just at the surrey body, but going all the way posterior to the Brooks membrane. And what we find is that there's some scleral thickening, rigidity occurring as we get older in life that's causing us not to have that disaccommodation and accommodation. So what we're finding, if you create these laser scleral microporations, so these lasers, these lasers that per per perform an 85% depth thickness uh, opening into the sclera around the eye in these four quadrants, we're finding you can increase the movement of that whole apparatus and mm -hmm. we're starting to see improvement in presbyopia. I was actually down in Panama seeing some of these post-ops and it's crazy. We're talking two, three, four line improvement in some, especially the younger 50, 60 year old presbyopes. And this is again, a lunchtime laser that could be also additional to our IOLs that we do later on and other, other let's say, accommodating lenses in the future, okay. this might also be an enhancement to those other lenses that may be coming out in the future. So I think I even in that world, that's exciting. But what how it correlates to glaucoma is what we found with the laser scleral microporation studies is that the IOP was going down. And so oh, what wow. the thought is, is that if you're decreasing the scleral rigidity, that hit the relaxing the scleral wall so it can move better, are you opening up the outflow system right? The TM, the conventional pathway system as well. And those micro pores over the surrey body is that causing some transciliary filtration to allow IOPs to go down. So even these, these, these eyes that we did, we talked 25, 30, 35% reduction in IOP. So that's something that they're waiting to, to do more studies on, but that's another laser that someday we might have. So just the, the idea of all these new technologies coming and crossing over from different subspecialties is exciting also as well. So it's pretty cool stuff, man. Well, it's hard to keep up then. I mean, it's like a, I mean, keep keep up on one specialty like glaucoma's tough, but I got to keep on the refractive <laughs> side and the cataract side and maybe a little bit on the retina side. It's like, it's a full-time job. It's a lot, man. It's a lot. And and the things when you do new stuff too, you got to know what you're, you got to believe in it because there are naysayers out there. And, I, and if I you taught my dad earlier and how what he taught me was, was one thing I'm doing a lot of recently is floater treatments. You know, I do a lot of laser floater treatments yes, for the last, yes, yes. I, the last I, I've never done one in my life. So I want to hear, I want to hear all about this. So, so I did the laser. So yeah, so what what I've done for many years is use the laser that had coaxial illumination and allowed us to basically visualize with the lens all the way from lens to the retina, right? So we can have a good spatial awareness and spatial context. It was there's certain type of lasers. This is the same YAG laser I have. It depends. Not all the lasers have the same coaxial illumination. So there's multiple companies that make coaxial illumination lasers that allow you to actually get that full breadth of depth. Uh, so Alex is one of them, or Lumenberg right. now. I think I know that Luminous now makes a version of that. LightMed makes a version. Okay, okay. I think even NIDEC makes a version that has, you want to make sure it's coaxial illumination. Okay. And why that's important is because if you look at what a, so a YAG laser, right? If, if you look at the illumination tower and the oculars and the right. laser are not on the same optical pathway. So for YAG capsulotomy, that's fine. Your, your, your illumination is coming from one end and your, your viewer oh, right. is coming from another end, right? But when you want to have coaxial illumination, you want to be able to see all the way from lens 
to the retina, that full range of vision. And so you're in full depth rather. So you need to have the the optics, the laser and the light source all lined up. All, all lined up. So that's why that you can see, because then what happens if you have the floater in focus and the retina is out of focus, you know you're far enough away from the retina to be able to fire without having any collateral damage. And what we do know from studies, when we were taught in, in residency, we were not taught at all about laser delivery of YAG lasers, it's just like fire and you're done, right? But okay. what we realized is, is I, I, that's what I was taught. Yeah, right? yeah. And what we realize now is, is, is a there's a um, the correlation, a nonlinear relationship between how much energy you fire in the laser and how much dispersion or the shock wave, right? So for instance, at one millijoule, okay. right, it's about 110 microns of shock wave. It's called the convergence zone. That's a, okay. when the, the plume and then it comes back towards your source. That old distance of energy, but by maybe 110 microns. If you go up to 10 millijoules on the laser, right? you see that the increase in energy to the conversion zone is less than 50%, about 250 to 300 microns. Okay. So even at seven, eight millijoules, which is what we're firing for YAG caps lot for YAG vitrolysis for floaters, we're going higher energy, but we're not significantly increasing the shock wave or the amount of the collateral energy that can be delivered. So that's one thing that people don't understand. So they think, oh my God, if you're doing five or six millijoules, you're going to blow up the eye, which you're not. Second thing we find how is that many people shots? Think you're so gonna, using seven, eight millijoules, and how many shots is a typical? Probably rate? six. I'm using it now around about five and a half or so. But oh, yes, we're using a lot more energy. Uh, okay, so so you're using higher energy. You only need like five or six shots of the laser. I'm doing about four to five hundred shots. Five hundred! Wow! Wow! Yeah, wow. I know. And we've and by the way, it sounds like simple. Yeah, we're just, no, we've done a lot of studies. We looked at ERG testing to make sure there's was no uh, no toxicity to the retina. We've done, we've done live. B, I have it online actually. Live B scans. We held a B scan probe temporally while we were firing the laser to see what was happening to the vitreous and to the retina. And Looking at the at poster holographic, nothing. There's no pulling. We're not causing traction. And if you see the the energy is only localized in that area where we're firing, so we're not seeing any any structural or physical or actually um, uh, performance of the retina changing over time. We did dark adaptation testing, we've done visual field testing in these patients, and we did not see an issue. Now, can you hit the retina if you fire? Yes, if you don't know how you're firing, you don't know where you are, can you focus on the retina and hit the retina? Absolutely, you can. Can you hit the lens if it's too anterior? Yes. So you, that's where the learning curve comes in is how do you know where you are spatially? So the laser is not the danger. It's truly the, the surgeon who's not comfortable using the laser that can cause problems. And so there's been a number of data sets that we published and others have published to show that this is a safe, especially for a Weiss ring. So where the vitrolysis does a great job for is a patient who has a Weiss ring who's complaining or even a solitary mass, like a clump that says, doc, it's kind of coming into my vision. I'm having a hard time focusing, driving, you know, watching TV, computer screens. That's the kind of patient where this works really, really well. Where it doesn't work well is when you have strings and clouds everywhere, like clouds mm -hmm. and like those are wonderful things. Synaresis. It's synaresis that's so bad because why? The laser does not vaporize a lot of one a lot of, at, at one time. It is vaporizing. People don't believe me, but it's not just breaking these pieces up into small pieces. You're actually vaporizing the vitreous opacities, but it's a small amount of vaporization, which is why I have to use three, 400 shots because we're not just trying to break up the white string. We're breaking it up and vaporizing. It's fractionating because remember, plasma or YAG laser is plasma. Plasma is solid to gaseous state. So we are mm. truly vaporizing these vitreous opacities, but to your point, we have to do many shots to, to actually vaporize enough to make it go away versus just break it up to a thousand pieces. And the problem is what we have found, the negative only adverse event I've seen significantly be an issue has been pressure spikes. When I've done patients, especially pseudophagic, right behind the lens, if, if the floaters are more anterior, sure. if you do too many shots, I think there's two things that happen. We can't get a pressure spike because of either, number one, some of the particles can come in the front, can go around the zonules and block the TM like a pseudoexfoliation picture, or the gas bubbles can actually start to cause a pressure rise. So I limit the number of shots, which is why sometimes these patients have synaresis and everything, if you do too many sessions over time, it doesn't work well. But for a Weiss ring, a solitary opacity, the vitreal lysis procedure is fantastic. We have literally, I've done about 6,000 lasers in the last decade and a half. And I'm telling you, it is a wonderful procedure for the right patient who's suffering. Not everybody needs it, and not everyone's a good candidate for it. But if you're a good candidate, it's awesome. But the other thing we're doing now, not to take too much time, but the other thing we're doing well, now. Well, I don't mind. Is, we have no rush. <laughs> I can talk for everybody. I'm sorry. But this is something that's truly revolutionized my, for me my practice has been this new procedure called one-step limited vitreous removal. I've gotten a lot of flack. Talk about people are not happy with me. I got a lot of flack for this. So there's a company called Vista Ophthalmics that's made a 27-gauge needle vitrector. So it's no trocar. You go like a 27-gauge needle like doing an intravitreal injection, right? Okay. You go right through the parts plane about three and a half millimeters behind the limbus. 
and I'll send you a video. And you go straight into the vitreous cavity and you hold it right behind the lens and with low vacuum in a pseudophagic patient post PVD with cineresis and all that stuff there, you just hold it, press your foot pedal, it's attached to your phaco machine, the Centurion or Stellaris or mm -hmm. whatever you use. And basically it is based upon the cut rate of that machine. So 5,000, 10,000 cuts per minute. And with low vacuum, you just press a button and, go brrr, and it basically is a dual blade, bi-blade vitrector, but there's no troll cars. And we have an AC maintainer and that's it. So now for all these pseudophaky patients who are suffering post, let's say multifocal IOLs or eat off lenses who are not happy, before taking those lenses out, you see all this debris you take that vitreous out and put, you know, do a vitrectomy, a limited vitreous removal, which is basically a core vitrectomy. So we're trying to avoid How much is the vitreous removing about, 6, about 65 to 70 percent of the vitreous. Basically, we're oh, leaving wow. the skirt. We're leaving the skirt of vitreous around the retina alone. So the key for this is not moving the 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 the, the uh, needle around. Park it in the middle of the eye right behind the lens and using very low vacuum under a hundred, like 60, 70 or so. And what we're doing is basically only trying to get whatever's liquefied, whatever's floating around to come to the tip and whatever's attached to the retina at the vitreous base, leave it alone. We don't want to pull stuff away from the peripheral retina. So about 65 to 70% even more you get rid of. And majority of the patients, we've had literally 120 patients we've done. We did a perspective study that we're actually gonna be publishing soon. I had one RD and I'll tell you what, why that happened out of the 120 patients. That already happened my first 10 patients. Why? Because when Vista came in, not to pull, run, run them over the, over the bus, but when they came in and told me to do this, they were saying, move it around and use high vacuum. But then I thought, we started thinking about it. Well, wait, why would we want to use high vacuum when we want to actually just get what was floating? So we went to have low vacuum and we're just parking in the middle of the eye. Since then, the last 110 patients plus, we have not seen any retinal breaks or tears. Again, we're picking patients who are pseudophagic post PVD already, but it's a wonderful procedure, especially those unhappy multifocal eye oil patients. Before you run to remove it, Think of the vitreous. It's a, a huge reason why some people are not as happy as well. And we have some data coming out soon on that. As okay, well. I got a lot of questions. So yes, this, this podcast, one of the primary things is to teach the young people the secret to success in ophthalmology. And the other is so I can learn. I'm here to learn. So I got a <laughs> lot of questions. I want to ask you about the the, the limited uh, single. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct me. And I also want to go back to the YAG, the YAG uh, fluorectomy stuff. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, so for the, the, now this one, you're in, you have an AC maintainer. Yeah. And then you have this single device, which is 27 gauge going parts planar, and it, it'll, it'll give vacuum plus cut. It, yeah. it doesn't infuse. The infusion is through the AC maintainer. Yep. But if you're taking out 60 or 70% of the vitreous, how are you getting aqueous? How do you get in the BSS back in the vitreous cavity? It goes around the zonules. It goes around the zonules, man. It's, it you you don't end up with an over overly deep AC? Not at all. Not at all. I'll send you. I'll, you know what? For the next cataractcoach.com, instead of a cataract surgery, I'm going to show you with the, one of these if that's okay with you. I need on, one on on un unedited man unedited you can do you can look at from start to finish what it's all about the chambers are rock solid they're not super deep you don't see any sh any kind of large you know kind of i'll, I'll, I'll take two, uh, two videos one of this and then one of the yeah uh, the floater thing the yeah i will absolutely man I'll, uh, wait, wait, absolutely. Wait, wait, more, more questions though <laughs> so now because i'm just thinking i mean i'm just okay if we do this i get it it'll clean up a lot of these floors especially the ones that are right behind the eye well totally makes sense but you know anytime a retina guy does a vitrectomy that retina you know doctor he or she is looking for entry site breaks at the end of the case, throwing yep. the indirect on. You doing all that too? Yeah, so what I do, so I, I don't do the indirect on at the time of the surgery. I immediately take them back to a room. So luckily I have my in-office surgical suite, so I do OBS. And so I do it for these procedures. So I go to one of my exam room lanes and I do put an indirect and look for any retinal breaks or tears as well. So we do have an argon laser. So if I saw one, I could do an argon laser or retinopexy if I needed to in the office. But yes, I am looking. Um, and so that's important. You want to look and I see him next day, at least also a week later, I want later to make sure. But that is something you have to consent them for. I mean, as much as I say it's safe and it is safe, it is true, a risk, risk, risk is an RD or a tear. Luckily, we have not seen that be an issue, the way we're doing it, the type of patients we're seeing it in. But I think you have to take a look at least to make sure there's nothing there. I agree. That's an important step. Yeah, how long does the procedure take, typical patient? About 10 minutes or so. Oh, it's so pretty reasonable. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you'll see real time. I mean, the actual- Are you, are you, are you, are you doing a block on these patients? No, topical, 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 topical. So imagine, you're, so imagine you're doing like an intravitreal injection, same thing. So I basically have them, the one thing I do is you don't- yeah, want to put a needle in the eye for 10 minutes. No, but but once it's in the eye, it's just no pain there. Just they're sitting there. It's, they're just sitting there. They have them looking light. A little subconscious light, or maybe. No, you could if you want to, but you don't have to. Honestly, so I'll I send you I'll send you videos. You just 
once you go in there, there's no pain. There is a little pressure. There's some pressure because it's it's a little bit not as easy to get into as let's say a, a 30 gauge needle for doing like a, a Vastin or some uh, anti vegf But once you get through that initial you know scleral uh, 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 pass, these patients are like, oh, that's it. They don't have any discomfort at all. They sit there and you kind of wait till it's done, and then boom, it'll ask you those. She tell you, doc. I can see it going away. I can see them going away. It's it's pretty cool. They're but wide awake with oral Valium, five milligrams of Valium, and that's no, it. It sounds that sounds amazing. And it was initially it was initially developed when patients. It was initially developed for for complex cases. So if you broke the capsule, if you're doing a planned IOL exchange, and you want to go ahead and remove the vitreous, this is a great way for an anterior segment surgeon who doesn't feel comfortable doing vitrectomies in the context of a poster capsule break inadvertently or a planned IOL exchange, this is a great tool for that. So if you're like, dude, this is too out there for floaters, I'm not gonna do all that, that I respect. But if you're ever in a situation where you're, God, I have a broken capsule, it is far, far better to do it in parse plan of vitrectomy of some sort than try to go from the anterior chamber and pull that stuff out. We get another dumb question. Then why not just use a 20, 27 gauge vitrectomy setup? You can, you can, absolutely. The problem is that you use this trocar. So what makes this unique yeah. is the needle tip and the needle itself has the bi-blade there because the way the 27 gauge needle vitrectomies are set up, you have these a trocar still, right, right. for those. Yeah, and yeah. so, but you could, but you absolutely could do a trocar and then use a 27 gauge needle too as well. This is no trocar with this, which makes it so unique is that it's just doop and you, you go in. There's no What's the trocar cost? I think it's like two hundred dollars. I think for the for That's the kit. Reasonable. Yeah, yeah. It's not thousands of dollars. On this is like two hundred some dollars, and it attaches to the um, FACO unit. So your whatever Centurion or Solaris or Quatera, whatever whatever you use, it could be attached to those FACO machines. So why not do the same city? You had a patient you're doing cataract surgery on, and it's a routine case. Everything goes great. You put in your special fancy lens, and then you know the patient also has a ton of vitreous floaters, cinderesis. Just clean it up at the same time. So you, you could, could do that. The machine open the packs. The, the tubing is already open. You could do that. In fact, I haven't done that because we're doing the study, but absolutely, that's a great opportunity. The only thing too is when you know when you have this main incision and stuff like that, the eye is a little softer, so it's harder to get into. Yeah. So that's the only reason why I like doing it as a standalone. But absolutely, you could. And I've, I had one capsule break where I did use it for for just to help clean up the vitreous because I broke the capsule, and it was great to be able to go in there with this thing and just cleaned everything up. And chamber was deep. I was able to put all this lens. It was nice and clean. So I, I think. A way to start using it, it would be if you ever had an issue like that. That's a great way to start if you're not comfortable using it now. But I'll send you a video, man. It's it's cool. it's truly totally revolutionized my practice because I felt always handcuffed because I would send a retina and I respect the retina colleagues and I respect the con I respect the concern that retina colleagues have of hey Paul, you're an anti segment surgeon, you're not doing endo laser at the same time, you're not looking at the periphery, right? right, right, right. So I respect that. I can look at that. I can tell you the data shows that it's safe and what we're doing with low vacuum and doing a core vitrectomy. Not we don't want to pull against the hyaluronic face. I have B scan probes also showing that with this procedure, we're not pulling against the the. Are you face. using a, ret a retina viewing system too, or are you just? Looking no, no. This I'm using is kind of straight. I'm just putting the needle right behind the lens, like above me, a few millimeters. And this is about a 15 uh, mill millimeter long needle, so I, I can't go down to hit the retina, no matter how far you go. So, but I have a coaxial illumination system, the Lumero system, so I can go pretty down. I can see the tip all the way when it's going back in the middle of the vitreous. So I don't really use a biome or any other retina visualization oh, this, system. This you're gonna send me 720p video. No, I had the new 850, man. We got HD 1090. Because oh, that, that was a whole whole nother hot mess that every one of these ones that were sold were like, here, here's your 720p cheapo camera. <laughs> no, no, oh, man. Well, look forward to the video. I definitely want to learn from it. I think it's pretty cool. Now I got questions going back to the Yag laser. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah well, I'm here to learn. I literally, literally am. <laughs> now, I see a patient, and you got this classic Weiss ring, PVD, the pseudophagic, and that Weiss ring is like, I don't know, just right in front of the retina. I'd be scared out of my mind throwing 400 shots of eight millijoules each or seven millijoules each. A millimeter, two millimeter in front of the retina? Yeah, you don't want to be a millimeter. So the good question. So two things. So talk about patient selection. First of all, I never do anybody who had a PVD within six months. I let them wait for two reasons. One, I want to recheck the retina, especially any new PVD. I haven't come back for a few months. Recheck the retina, see if it's an evolving PVD, see if any tear I missed. Number two, I want to give them time to neuroadapt, right? A lot of these patients, they will neuroadapt to these things. Right. So why do it unless they have an opportunity? So give them an opportunity to neuroadapt. Now, if they've not neuroadapted, and you've had, you check, there's no breaks a couple of times. Then I look at how far it is. Absolutely right. Can I see it, number one? And how far is it from the retina? If it's within in a, a 
around two to three millimeters from the retina, I don't do it. I agree, especially if it's over the optic nerve, because if you miss, you're screwed, right? Now, the safety zone, we look at the, the shock wave, you look at the data we've done, and now for the sake of time, you have to trust me in this one, about two millimeters is a safe zone, where you, if you fire two millimeters from the retina, you're not going to hit the retina from it. Well, but how do you know? It's like 200 mic 250 microns. Yeah, that's it. And, and remember, a plasma cone, right? It goes, mm -hmm. the plasma will form, it'll, and it'll form a plasma, and then an acoustic wave of energy will form, and a shield will form to prevent further posterior propagation. So plasma has a self-limiting uh, property that it actually the fire, the energy will come back towards a source. So we're not worried about that, but how do you know you're exactly two millimeters from the retina? It's hard, right? So that's uh -huh. why for any any new surgeon, what here's the, here's the best way to think about it. If you're focusing with your 90 diopter, your 60 diopter lens in your slit lamp in your exam room, and you're looking at that floater, right, right with coaxial illumination with your normal slit lamp, right, and you look with your 90 diopter lens, if that floater's in focus and you do not see the retina in focus, you are far beyond three millimeters. So that's the, right. the litmus test. So if for you, let's say you're starting this out, right? If you see a floater and the nerve is in focus at the same time as a floater, not doing it, man. But if you're focusing on the Weiss ring and you don't see the retina or the retina, the nerve in focus at all, if it could be obscured, but if you don't see it at all specifically, now you're well be in the middle of the vitreous, you're mm. far enough away. That's the, that's what I use to pre prevent any problems. Cause you're right, you gotta be safe. <laughs> Never wanna hit the retina that's or a, the that, nerve. <laughs> well, it's smart to have that fail safe. That's really smart actually. Yeah, so that's what I use as my fail safe. No, that makes it, that makes it. Now it begs the other question though. I got such great retina people around me. Let me just send the patient there for a proper three port 27, 25 gauge retractomy. You'll have zero floaters. Just okay. I love that. And I agree with you. But majority of retina surgeon, and, and I might be wrong with this, but everyone I've asked will not go in the eye for a vice ring. They'll go in the eye for cineresis for those clouds and strings everywhere. Well, you need to Absolutely. come to Beverly Hills. <laughs> oh, they they will they will for you guys okay it's so there's no problem okay so if they if they'll do look if I respect it but I'll be honest with you there's always that risk benefit ratio right so for a Weiss ring our yeah. data shows ninety plus percent satisfaction I mean these these are in office five minute procedures no cut in the eye no drops and even though a retina surgeon who are and they're amazing retina surgeons out there doing twenty seven gauge vitrectomies in ten minutes in yeah. and out and they're quick I agree with you. The problem is you're not taking the time and the cost of the surgery, surgery center, the post-op, the time off of work, the drops that are on, all that, and the risk of infection, even though it's very low, right? Sure. So all that for a Weiss ring to me. Now, if it's cinerasis, so where's that where's that national going to compete with? You're right, LVR. If, if, if I'm a retina surgeon doing 27 gauge vitrectomy and I'm, you have an anterior segment surgeon doing an LVR, I can see that rationale saying, well, look, dude, there's a retina guy who'll do it a 27 gauge in 10 minutes. Go, go to them. I can respect that. And that makes sense. So if you don't have, if you have retina guys near you who are aggressive enough to say, yeah, I'm going to take care of these photos. I agree with you. Then I would send them to retina. I agree. But if you're someone who doesn't have that and you have a lot of patients with floaters and you're a pseudo faking patients are hanging out, that's an opportunity where I would use the LVR. But having a retina guy who does it nearby, I can see why that would be a better option for a lot of surgeons. That makes sense. Well, I think part of it too, though, is like, I bet you your patients are a lot sweeter and less demanding than mine. I mean, they're all, everyone's kind of demanding, but I mean, like I had a, literally had a patient this week <laughs> who was bang on plane or whatever surgery, comes back at like the month one visit after I just had a surgery. It's minus a quarter and they're just so upset. It's not good yeah. anymore. It, it happens. It happens here, but not, not, there is something about the nice Midwest charm. There is, there is that Midwest uh, trust and it's, it, it is pretty cool, man. It is cool. And I agree paying, with you. Who's paying huh? for the egg laser, uh, you know, vitriolysis? So, so, so if you look at Corcoran's edict many years ago when it first came out, there's basically two types of ways to code this thing and to document it. If you document the, a, a Weiss ring and your goal is to vaporize it, it's a cash only procedure. So we charge 600 bucks for it. Now, if it's a, uh, a cineresis type of like a amorphous cloud and you're trying to like break it and actually move it out of the visual axis, just like sever it, then you can use, and this is if you document the correct, correct way, and of course you have symptomology, et cetera, you can doctor this actually a vitreolysis code that was that was used for many years to sever, remember, vitreous strands coming to the anterior chamber? Oh, right. That same code, if you're documenting, you're trying to sever the strand to move it out of the visual axis. So there is, so if that's your main goal, you, you can code it that way and get insurance to cover it. If your main goal is, hey, I'm going to vaporize this and just vaporize a Weiss ring, then it's out of pocket. And that's right. So for those Weiss ring kind of patients, I'll charge out of pocket for and cash and try to vaporize it. For those strings, sure. I'll say, okay, let me just try to sever it if I can get out of the way kind of thing sometimes. And it'll charge insurance for the one.
But six hundred. I mean, this is like could be multiple visits. Or if you're doing four hundred shots, you don't want the pressure to go up. You're getting too many champagne bubbles. You may only do a couple well, hundred shots. So well, when we presented our data at ASCRS many years ago, we had we actually have had now, we present, I think, over a thousand cases, but our first 300 plus cases, the average session was 1.2 sessions for a Weiss ring. For a Weiss oh, ring, the average number of shots was less than 400 because a Weiss ring absorbs the energy really well and it's a very clear endpoint. And it's a very clear association between signs and symptoms, right? When someone comes in and say, I have a spot right in my right corner here, it comes right. in the middle, and you see it, it's like a no brainer. It is what's causing it. And it's very easy to see the end point and it's gone, right? So those patients, we very rarely have to do a second, third treatment. Now the synoresis, amorphous cloud kind of patient, that's where it can be a pain in the ass. And that's where I think a vitrectomy, whether it's a 27 gauge vitrector from a retina surgeon or the LVR is probably a better option. Now, faking patients, I don't do the LVR on. I only do them on pseudophagic post uh, sure. you know, cataract patients. So that's where I would send to a retina person. I have a great retina specialist in our area, and he does a lot of great vitrectomies as well. So I, I send a lot of those patients to him too. If I'm concerned, if they have some history of, you know, let's say some retina issues or thin retina or something like that, lattice, I'll send mm -hmm. to him. <laughs> it's just easier and safer that way. Remember the cataract coach quote, share the love and the liability with the retina surgeon. There you go, man. It never a bad idea. And I'll tell I'll look, I have a right in the retina guy, to be fair, he's really good. He's really nice. He yeah. doesn't like the fact I'm doing these one steps, but he's like, look, man, if you're gonna do them, I want to be there for you if you need me. And so he's been oh, really good great. about saying, look, if you need me to see someone, I don't like that you're doing it. Like he's straight up about it. But he's been very respectful to say, look, I'll take care of your patients if need be. So that's been great to have that back up. I feel your heart. You're putting patients first. You're doing what you think is best for your patients. And basically, the, the, the lessons your dad taught you. So I, I really admire that. Now, no, you also that. said you're doing in-office surgery. Tell me about this. You're probably one of the pioneers here doing in-office surgery. Tell me all about this. I want to know. Oh, man, I love it. I love it. First of all, you know, so I'm lucky because I have an ASC that I'm part owner of as well as I have my in-office. I just did, I just did 20 cases this app. That's why I'm here my scrubs today. Um, I did 20 cases today. Got the new uh, new scope and everything we're trying out today, which is awesome. But um, it's wonderful for, for so many reasons. Number one, the staff. Our staff is fully engaged. They are, they, it's a, they're, they're, they're accountable to themselves. They feel vested in this thing. The your same, same, your same staff that was with the patient in the clinic. You got it. So I have my, it's my surgical scheduler. We do have a trained, uh, we have they're all trained by the way, to do teching as well as do surgical teching, but they all cross train to do pre-op, to do sterilization processing, to do floating, et cetera. Um, but they see the patients pre-op. They see the patients intra-op, right? Doing the surgery. And then post-op, they get to see this. So they see the whole cycle. So now I, I have so much faith and confidence in my staff. Number two, the experience for the patient, man. We, I never believed until we started doing OBS that five milligrams of Valium was all you needed. What's I OBS? needed my first well, office, office based office, surgery. I'm sorry, OBS, okay. office based surgery. So until I'm sorry, man. So instead of just trying to do an office based surgery, OBS, I thought you needed burst head. I thought you needed some fentanyl or something else in there, right? So I was so anti that. But when they're like, no, try it, try it, try it, try it. I did our first 10 cases, 20 cases. Now we're well over a thousand cases. And I'm telling you, it is amazing how comfortable people are because of why they're familiar with the center. You have lounge chairs. They're not NPO because they're not IV sedations, oral sedation. So they can eat the morning of. So there's no IV. They're much more relaxed when they come in. So when they come into the o OBS, the office surgery suite itself, which is fully stocked, it looks like an any ASC OR. But when you go right. in there, they're just not as stressed out. And the, and the volume calms them down enough, but they're still cooperative. Unlike those verse that even one milligram in a young kid, a young patient can get them to be snow and they disinhibit and all of a sudden you can't, you know, can't talk to them. So right. I've been surprised at how comfortable people are with just five milligrams of Valium. We do have the ability to do, you know, almost everything, glaucoma, we do cataracts, we do you know, refractive, you name it in the office, but cataracts are bread and butter and glaucoma has been our bread and butter for that. But the patient experience has been phenomenal. Uh, the staff experience has been phenomenal. And we can bundle a lot of the cost for premium IOLs, for ICLs, for RLEs, all in this office space, which has been great from a cost perspective for the patients. And then flow and efficiencies have gotten better and better now. There have been situations where if I had one, I very rarely had a retained lens fragment, but about six months ago, I had a retained lens fragment. I was like, oh my God. So historically, I would have had to call the ASC or the hospital, get time, get block time. Patient had to go over there. It's a whole other bill. Here, it was like, oh, 
you know what? Let's go back over there. Hey, Lisa, Pam, or Lisa, Melanie, can you open up the center? Bam, we did it. Patient went home. It was all good. So the patient was comfortable. They didn't feel like anything bad was going on, and it was easy to take care of that. So for urgent issues too, it's great having that office space surgery suite as well. So we've been we've been really lucky to have that opportunity. So all my premium IOLs, if they're a good candidate, and we'll talk about health and disposition of pre-operatively, sure. but if they're a good, healthy person, if they're getting a premium IOL of some sort of some premium package, I do that in the office. The ASC, I tend to take care of more of my standard cases just because of flow and more efficiencies there. I have three rooms there that I can use. So there, and also I do a lot of my glaucoma there because that way a lot of the cost of goods aren't reimbursed consistently in the office space suite. So that's why I do a lot of my like MIGS cataract stuff or sandal of MIGS at the ASC right now because of insurance and, and reimbursement. But how, how overall it's been fantastic. How, how do you build, for, let's say you have a patient, Medicare patient who wants to get some premium presbyopic IOL. How are you billing for to do it in your, in your in your out your office based surgery center so good question so there's there's two there's a few different ways for the medicare fee for service with a supplement kind of patient right that's straight up medicare you can't bill you can't bill it's 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 out of network it's not even out of network it's just not billable so it's it's a non-covered facility because of that you can do an avn it's all legal to say hey look this is a non-covered facility you can charge them out of pocket you know charge them five six seven hundred dollars the assumption cost is our convenience fee for it so you have an avn form and do that if it's a pack a premium IOL package, just roll it into that premium IOL package and then it all kind of comes together that way. If they're a Medicare Advantage or commercial, they have an out of network benefit, then you can charge that you can actually negotiate a rate. So whether you use IOR, you do it on your own, doesn't matter. You can go to the the, the, the payers and say, hey, we want to negotiate a rate for this patient. This is how much I would know what we're doing. This is how much we paid. I know this is not a covered facility, but let's negotiate. And we're getting payments from those non-covered or those mm. out-of-network benefits. So, so if it's out-of-network, commercial or Medicare Advantage, you can go to those payers and get paid consistently. And what you can do is still charge that ABN fee because it's out of network initially just to make sure that you get at least your cost reimbursed initially. So there's there's multiple ways of doing it. The problem with the out of network is that you aren't always consistently getting paid the same with everybody. So if you have mm -hmm. a cost of goods issue, if you're doing a, a, a boniotomy with an X, Y, and Z, you know, blade, or you're doing some kind of canaloplasty with a or stent where you have $1,500 cost to these things, you can't always get guaranteed that you're going to get reimbursed for that mm. for the cost of goods. That's why I take most of them to my um, ASC. Now, for research, it's been awesome. I'm doing the mini jack studies in there, the eye stent studies we did there. We're doing, you know, so the MIM study, doing a bunch of the glaucoma studies in the office space surgery suite, which is wonderful. So it's been great for those kind of situations. But for the standard cases, we tend to do it over at the ASC for that reason. So, of 100% of surgeries you do in a year, like surgery you do in an operating room, not just you know, not just that, like a YAG but your license or something. Yeah, you know, a real like cataracts and stuff. Yeah, like a real surgery. What percent are in the OBS and what percent are in the in the ASC? We're we're probably about 70, 30 right now. Seventy percent ASC, thirty percent OBS. Yeah, it's a pretty good. I mean, it's a, it's a good amount. Like I said, it's twenty today, so it's it's a good amount. I'm still doing more at the ASC, obviously because I'm part owner, and so I have obligations there. But plus, the, the flow is. I mean, I can do two to three an hour in the office pretty comfortably here, but I can do you know five or six an hour at the ASC. So it just makes sense for a lot of the standard cataracts to go over there. So it's been a good balance, and then I'm at, at the hospitals too. I have a hospital systems here where I can do surgery after I have those complex tubes and this and that, and then and patients that say a lot of comorbidities. You know, that's the thing too with office based surgery. If they have a significant significant comorbidity, weight issues, you know, COPD on, on oxygen, et cetera. I'm not doing them there. I'm doing it at the ASC or the hospital. So that's also something important to recognize that you got to pick the right patients too for office. Right. Just for that, be nine, the 94 year old with about a laundry list of like 40 medicines that are on, let's just share the love and the liability with the anesthesiologist too. Exactly. So there's a, that's, yeah. I'm lucky because I have that opportunity. So it's like, why not? Why, you know, I'm not trying to push everybody to the OBS. Right. But it's wonderful if you can do it and you have the opportunity to do it. I think it makes so much sense. And look, we know how many more patients are going to be needing cataract surgery. We know that there's still a yeah. flat curve of ophthalmologists coming out of surge for surgery. So who's going to take care of these? And not everyone has an ASC or access to the ASC and even getting time at the ASC, right? And so this is a great opportunity for those who don't have, let's say you're in a CON state or you don't have the ability to get more block time at your ASC. This is an opportunity, I think, to take care of some of those patients. And it's still, I still think we need ASCs or hospitals. I'm not here to say one or the other. Like yeah. you said, share the love. They both have a place, in my opinion. No, that, that makes a, a ton of sense. But now what about like, you got a guy who's coming in for refractive lens exchange. So that's all out of pocket. But mm -hmm. he's real squirrely, real squirrely with the eyes and the trying to put the drops in the axle. You're just going to. 
take them to the surgery center and then snow them, right? Yeah, I mean, look, you, you got that's where your comfort level as a surgeon and your ability to really truly anticipate who's going to be one of those, oh my God, what I do for my, what I do this patient. And yes, if they're like, ah, get away from me. Yeah, I, I'm not, you know, like we can give, we can, you can give them an MKOML, which is midazolam, ketamine, adastron. You can give those, there's the oral, you know, oral sedation is more powerful than Valium. But even then, I, I'd want to be able to have an anesthesiologist give them something more IV if I needed to. So you're right. That's where you got to use your judgment and be like, yeah, is, is it is it worth it or not for that one patient? Nah, let's not make it. Let's not stress my life. I'm getting older. I got the grades coming. Let's not make it stressful, dude. <laughs> it's not worth it. Yeah, I'm mostly <laughs> you look good. I love the daddy, man. It's awesome. <laughs> little, little, got a little bit of a beard going here. Um, now you mentioned also that you do a lot of studies now for some companies. It's easier to do in your in your office based surgery setup. Awesome. So you you how, how young people ask me this question all the time. How do I get involved in this? And you and I did before I even had a podcast. You and I did like an interview for like 20, 30 minutes about this. But let's kind of reiterate some of those points. How do you have a a young ophthalmologist, mid thirties, early career, wants to get involved? Like I want to be like Paul Singh. I don't want to get <laughs> be like me, trust me, but <laughs> be like Uday. This guy's the no. man, dude. Um, How did they get involved? What's the first step? Well, first, first step is you gotta actually just a few things. If it's if it's getting involved with the industry in general, or is it in, in getting involved with research? If you want to get involved with research, you gotta set up your own research kind of infrastructure. That is key because any industry sponsored research at least if you want to get involved that way they're going to want to have do you have research coordinator do you right. have a technicians who can do it and then you have the volume of patients who because look these guys especially if you want to do industry sponsored phase two three four trials there's a lot of money they're spending and, and time is a big big issue for them so they want to make sure you have enough patients to get enrolled and you have the infrastructure to do right. that to follow the protocols right now if you don't have all that that's okay you can do some amazing research on your own do outcome analyses research. Look, research does not mean you have to be at some new phase two trial right. of a new product coming out. You can do outcome analysis, retrospective analysis. Get your name out there by looking at your own data. So a true story. I, when I went to Duke for my fellowship, I loved Duke. It changed my life. I, I owe so much to so many of my mentors at Duke who just gave me, it, it kind of whipped me into shape, let's say. And so my attending, David Epstein, who passed away, unfortunately, he was a chairman at Duke many years ago, when he was like, hey, do you want to stay on as a teaching attending? Because he knew I loved it there. Um, I was like, well, no, my dad. So I asked him, my dad, dad, I think I might want to stay at Duke as a teaching attending. You know, and he goes, he goes, what is wrong with you? <laughs> he, he gave me the virtual slap. He's like, come home, stupid. I said, okay, dad. So I will come home. But I'm so glad I did because it was like, dad, that was the smartest thing. But I told my chairman, I'm like, Dr. Epstein, I, I really want to stay here, but I want to go home with my dad. And, you know, it's a great opportunity. My dad, he goes, dude, go home. But you can do some amazing, because I wanted to do research and be with fellows, et cetera. He goes, you can do some amazing research at home. Pay attention to your outcomes. Pay attention right. to your patients. You have a wealth. If you have your own private practice, you have a wealth of patients, a wealth of data that people are dying to learn about. Just know what, just think of something that you're a question you have and say, yeah, I'm curious. How is that outcome of that? What is this kind of patient population? Get out there, do some abstracts, publish some stuff, go to even ASCRS and you know AAO and all the other meetings, Caribbean Eye, you name it, tell it like it is, just submit something and try to do it, go on the podium. That way your name gets out there, people see you doing, they, they say, yeah, this, this person's thinking works great. And then you can start to get more involved with research. Get GCP trained, good clinical practice trained, and get a research coordinator. It doesn't cost a lot to get someone to come on board and start to get that process. And then you can then also then ask research, reach out to them. Say, look, I have this. I've already done some publications. I have the infrastructure. I love this topic. I'm a glaucoma specialist. I'm a retina specialist, cornea, whatever it is. And then say, can I get involved? And really reach out, hound them. Hound them, you got to advocate for yourself. You know, you can't expect people to come and say, hey, do you want to do research? They're, they don't know who you are. They don't know who's out there wanting to do research. Yeah. They're always looking. And ask people like you and me, because if we're involved with research, with opportunities, with industry especially, they are always looking for new sites because people change, right? A lot of sites dwell yeah. out, they kind of fizzle out. So they, if they're slow to, let's say, recruit a certain study, they're always looking, even in the middle of a study, hey, we need to get some more sites. And so you can be one of those new sites. So reach out to other people in studies already to say, hey, do you, do you know how I can get involved? Do you think there's any way you can give me contact of the study coordinators for these things and the, and the sponsors? And so these are all the little things you can do to kind of get involved. Yeah, I think it's important to point out, like you did, that you don't necessarily have to do a clinical trial of a new product for a company. Like I had a very difficult time in my patient population convincing someone, hey, let me do this experimental thing to you and we'll pay you a, we'll pay you a modest honorarium. And the patients, 
in my neck of the woods, they're like, their handbag costs more than my car. <laughs> and so I'm just, they just tell me, a doc, no thanks. So I had I'm a good. really difficult time of enrolling. So I don't do any of those cl clinical trials. I'll do what you do. I'll look at my own analysis. I'll work with companies at an earlier stage, earlier startups. But I know in my practice, I shouldn't be doing clinical trials. That's a really good point. I mean, if you the patient base you have, are they willing to take on these trials? And and a lot of times, you know, phase four are great to get involved with. Phase four trials, like I'm in a phase four trial now, comparing different kind of MIGS procedures. They're all FDA approved. So I say to a patient, look, I'm going to do a procedure for you regardless. These are all already approved. But we're just comparing kind of these two different ones that have never been never been compared. And so there's 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 some type of studies that can work in that situation where it's not a big issue of us experimental. But yes, there's some studies where it is like experimental or the way I say it, these are these are novel technologies that we're working on. So the one, a couple of them I have, what we're doing right now are already approved in Europe. So it's great to say to a patient, hey, you know what? There's a, these are technologies that are already approved and being done in Europe. We're just bringing them here to the United States. We'd like to be part of that. And that, that helps too as well. But, but it is hard, you're right, to convince some patients if they're not really into it, to do an experimental study like that. Ah, it's not worth it. <laughs> I'm good. But that takes time and, and takes a lot of training to understand how to have that conversation, which is important too. So you get a young doc, he or she, let's say, just starting out practice, been there a few years, kind of getting good momentum, done a couple thousand cases, they're really feeling good. And they're, okay, they got a great idea, a great presentation, a great something. How do they get that on the podium? So a couple of things. You there's a lot of opportunities for videos, right? There's so if you there's video submissions. So if you have a video idea, uh, a new technique, a new technology that you're using, submit it to AAO, ASCRS, go on even like the cataractcoach.com to get it out there. But no, there it's it's the, hey, that was that was good, right? But no, but I mean look, by the way, you are like the most famous. I mean, first of all, I got to say, I respect so much what you do for all of our young Thank ophthalmologists, you. man. It is so key. I've gone onto your site and just like, hey, I wonder if he, oh, there it is. I'm learning all this stuff all the time with you. Oh, so thank, thank you, you for having that library of, of all these different videos. It's so, so immensely helpful. But I mean, these things like that, getting them out on your type of uh, programs and podcasts, et cetera, are going to be key. Um, submitting them to video journals. There's all sorts of ways to get out there and submit an abstract. You can go to ASC REST and then there's an abstract open till ne for next year. There's a whole thing for videos. There's a whole thing for a novel, you know, case series, case study. So my just submit and submit and submit because that is going to be the key. And even a smaller tier meeting is great to start. Smaller tier meaning, not yeah. the large meetings, Caribbean Eye, ACOS, um, you know, Tell Like It Is, you, you name it, all these, you know, Kiwa Eye, Hawaii and I, all these meetings that are not the same size as AAO are always looking for these kind of newer novel ideas. So be oh. open to other meetings that are not as traditional and those are all great avenues to get going. I totally agree with you. They strongly recommend you submit to a smaller meeting like OSN New York. These yeah, meetings great, great OSN, like it is or Hawaii and I or ACOS or all these, they usually set their program at least six months in advance. So if you reach out to those programs six months in advance, See who are the sec who are the who are the chief the section editors or the section leaders, and they're they're, they're ophthalmologists. Email them, figure out what their email is, and say, "Hey, I'd love to present. I have a brief talk." And the most important thing I tell you is, give the talk that you want to hear. Make it fun, make it engaging, keep it moving. And the most important thing of all, if you're allowed to give a seven minute talk, you do not make it eight minutes. It is ah. exactly seven minutes or less. And I, I will say that you are so impressive because what you guys, what a lot of you people don't know out there, what Udi does when he does his catacoach.com presentations now, it's all pre-recorded videos that he speaks over and does a voiceover and he's planned it perfectly. That is genius, first of all, because I love that because yeah. you can never go over and you plan how much time you have for panel discussion. So as right. no one can ever kind of voice say, look, I have 30 seconds or 60 seconds, talk guys, and that's it, and we're done. And you move on to the next video. I think yeah. that's genius. But I love the idea of making it fun. First of all, one thing that, you know, you and I spoke about this, I speak for a lot of industry. And and one thing you told me many years ago, and, and I still hold the first right, you gotta speak for something and do and only speak on technologies and techniques and topics that you believe in, that you do. Right. If you start to start to fade away from that, you speak only because someone's telling you to speak, you lose credibility. You lose credibility, you have nothing. And that is so important to only speak on something that you, you truly are passionate about, you believe in, and you can grab. Because worst case scenario, someone asks you a question, you can say, well, you know what? 
in my experience of doing X amount of thousands of cases, this is what I see in my practice, right? You still have that. And that means a lot to people in the audience. So if you're authentic and you speak on what you believe in and have seen in your practice, that shines through no matter what. Number All two right. is make it make it exciting, make it fun. Like I do music videos and make fun of people. Have fun with it. Bring your own personality. So for me, I love, I'm a passionate musician, I'm not the best musician, but I'm passionate about music. And so I love making and writing music. So I've had I've had more fun now creating songs for ophthalmology presentations than I do actually presenting on the data because it's so much fun and making fun <laughs> of my friends and stuff like that. But that's what makes it fun. That's what makes people engage right. and want to listen. So, yeah, I agree with you. Have fun with it. Enjoy it. Yeah, you speak from the heart. And that's a good point, too, is that you don't become an overnight success overnight. It takes 10 years. <laughs> it takes 10 years to build your credibility. And remember, it takes 10 minutes to lose it. Absolutely, man. And, and you've been very clear with me on that. You've been very clear with me on that, Paul. Never lose sight of that because we, we've had some discussions. Like, you, how can you speak about that company? Well, but here's the I really do this, right? And so you're challenging me all the time. And I love that because you never want to lose sight of that, man. So thank you for that, really. Oh, just is it to have a colleague like you, a friend like you, what a, what a blessing. <laughs> I got to talk to you about Funka Daisy. Now, you are not, you are very yeah. modest when you say you're just a beginning musician. You're, amateur. you're, a, you're a legit <laughs> professional musician. You've got records out. You have albums. You do concerts, like attended by thousands. You played in front of presidents. Yeah, man, Obama. Obama. We played it. Do you know my favorite moment was playing for Prince, opening up for Prince. Did I ever tell you, you that story? This is amazing. All right, I, I gotta tell you the story. Sorry, <laughs> this is, okay. it's 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 all it's luck. It's not because we were that good or anything. But so what happened was I'm gonna I'm gonna name drop here. So George Lucas many years ago got married to a lady from the south side of Chicago. So okay. they came back to Chicago to celebrate their their wedding. This is like in 2012 or something. And so when she, they came here, her, his fiance or his wife was friends with Prince, who's up in of course Minneapolis or who was in Minneapolis. So she calls Prince and says, "Hey, I'm coming to Chicago next week Friday. Come." and play and jam with your band and at, my, at our reception kind of thing. So Prince wakes up Saturday morning after playing at that George Lucas wedding reception in Chicago. And he's like, I'm about to go on tour. I'm in Chicago with my band. I want to play. So that night we were headlining some, a place called the City Winery. It's a really cool venue in Chicago. And mm -hmm. so we are, but it's band, the band I'm in is called Funka Desi. It mixes Indian funk and reggae. And um, so we're the headliners. We get a call around noon and we get a call saying, hey, um, do you guys mind cutting your set list short? Set your set list short and open up for someone else. And we're all like, no, man, it's our gig. And we're all mad. They're like, trust me, you want to open up for this person. You're opening up for Prince. And we're like, Prince of what? Prince of who? <laughs> you're like, what are you talking about? They're like, and they're, they're no, like purple Prince. Rain. The guy, exactly, the artist formerly known as Prince Gun. What? So, yeah. So, what happened was we cut our set list short. And so Prince went and they sold tickets like within 30 seconds, they were all sold out for his show, which is right after ours. But the coolest thing is his band came on. I got to meet his band. They were awesome. But this is a very small venue. So we got to say, stay side stage and watch Prince perform. And just to see this guy, anytime you see someone who is that good at their craft, who has that much command of their craft, mm -hmm. it is just so awesome. It's like it's seeing a beautiful surgery, a beautiful this. Like it's just like mm -hmm. wow. And to see him perform live was just like <laughs> it was it was incredible, man. But we've had a lot of opportunities, man. We we played for a uh, Prince Obama was when he was running for uh, for uh, senator. He played we played in Chicago. Uh, he he asked us to play uh, kind of just uh, mix Indian funk and reggae in his one of his uh, as uh, rallies. Uh, we opened up for. Uh, uh, Los Lobos, uh, Shaka Khan, when Shaka Khan got her name, wow. uh, street named after her, we got a chance to play in Pittsburgh Pavilion, Chicago. Um, so our goal, honestly, it sounds cheesy, but our goal is to teach diversity inclusion, but through the music, to teach culture through the music, right? Because our, one of our drummer who passed away, his famous phrase was, look, look, brother, he goes, a 4-4 four, four rhythm is a 4-4 rhythm in India, Africa, Puerto Rico, Jamaica. It's a 4-4 rhythm. And, and that was a very philosophical, not just a more of a musical term, but a philosophical statement to make. And so our motto is one family, many children. We're one family, oh, as, like as, as, but, we're, but we all are different, right? It's okay yeah. to be different, but there's more that binds us than separates us. And if we can focus on what binds us and what connects us, so much better in life, right? And so, oh, so that's the motto. That. And, that, and that's what I love so much about the band. I and mean, we have people from India, Africa, Puerto Rico, Jamaica. We have Sikhs, Hindus, atheists, Jewish people, Muslim people, Christian people. We have s such a diversity in age and socioeconomic background and education. But when we're on and we're in the band, we're playing music, 
We don't see any of that. It's just we're all one band, and that, that's yeah, the beautiful thing about it. That's, that's awesome. Thing about it. Yeah, wow, man, it's it's a, a crazy time, fantastic. crazy times. Yeah, that is fantastic. Well, I want to thank you again for this podcast. I always love talking. I can't believe we've been talking for an hour. It just goes like, wow, like cow. that. Oh yeah. my god! I'm like sorry, that. dude. I'm sorry, but no, I love it. Hour. It's perfect, <laughs> and I want to re recommend to all our young viewers and listeners: if you see Paul at a, a cat at a Funk and Daisy concert, or the Academy AS for S any meeting, please feel free to come up to him, introduce yourself, ask him questions. He is the sweetest guy. He'll help you with anything. Anything, guys. Oh no, I love it. And you are one of my mentors, man. Thank you for always keeping me real, keep me on track, and uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. I love it. I love what uh, you do. I really Thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. I do appreciate it. Remind our listeners and viewers, remember, I got a new podcast every single Sunday. Top podcast in all of ophthalmology now. Stay tuned because, as you know, our only goal is to teach you the secret to success and plus for me to learn a lot, too. And also, <laughs> we've got a new cataract coach video every single day. Anyway, oh, Paul's going to give us a couple of good videos. I we're promise gonna you. This we're going to feature tomorrow after the podcast. It'll be the, the YAG Vitro License uh, a video as well as the limited one step. video. Yep. One, one step, step limited video. You got it. All right, guys. Until next time, I'll catch you later.